Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's Healthy Living Lecture event on managing your hearing loss, which is hosted by Henry Ford's Senior Healthy Living Program. My name is Dr. Erica Bennett, and I will be your moderator for today's lecture, and I'm an audiologist with Henry Ford Health. I uh, do want to let you know that closed captioning is available for this presentation. There is a closed caption button in the left hand corner of your screen where you can turn it on or off um, depending on your preferences. This morning you'll be hearing from or this afternoon you'll be hearing from Dr. Brad Stack, um, an audiologist and director of the Division of Audiology at Henry Ford Health. Dr. Stack will be discussing hearing loss, its impact on your health and the importance of establishing care early. He will also provide an overview of hearing aids and the importance of hearing care necessary for successful fitting and adjustment to your specific hearing loss. Following Dr. Stack's presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. So if you have a question during or after our presentation, please make sure you type it into the chat box. Do please avoid sharing any personal medical information in that chat box. Um, to ensure a smoother experience for everyone, please turn off your cameras during this presentation. Um, and please note that your microphones have been muted. This lecture is being recorded. It will be available to watch again at your convenience on the Healthy Living Lecture Series webpage, and that's at henryford.com slash healthy living lectures. I am now pleased to introduce Dr. Brad Steck. Well, thank you, Dr. Bennett. I appreciate the introduction and thanks to all of you for uh, joining us today um, to hear about hearing loss and, and managing your hearing loss. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to give you a brief overview of, uh, uh, of how the how the ear works, what can go wrong with it, uh, the causes of hearing loss, and um, and then uh, a little bit about the effect of hearing loss on um, on your ability to communicate and hear speech, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, modern hearing aids and and solutions and the, and how you can approach. Um, those of you who maybe haven't started uh, the process, how you can approach um, managing your hearing loss. So um, with that, I'm going to turn on some slides and start talking with you a little bit about, uh, about um, uh, how the ear works. So I'm going to uh, take you back to your biology class, which probably many of you haven't had in a long time. But to show you here a cartoon of the ear um, and talk a little bit about the really important structures. Um, we called, we uh, not very cleverly call this the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. And they all have important functions in, in how we hear. Um, the outer ear is the is the part that hangs on the side of your head and the uh, the uh, ear canal. It helps you focus. It helps sound uh, to conduct to your inner ear. So it helps conduct sound to your inner ear. It um, helps your. Uh, it it allows focusing and resonating of certain um, sounds. Um, and it's an important uh, first part of your hearing. So. When we put a hearing aid over your ear, we take away a lot of the important uh, processes here in the outer ear that we have to put back in some way. Um, this is the eardrum. We call it the tympanic membrane, and it vibrates. Um, sound is nothing more than uh, pressure vibrations, and they set this, uh, this eardrum into motion. Um, when it uh, moves back and forth, it moves these bones in the middle ear, they're called the ossicles, um, and, uh, and transforms this acoustic um, uh, sound um, into actually energy in the inner ear. Um, the, the middle ear um, is, uh, is uh, air, so is air, air filled space, and uh, this tube down here is called the eustachian tube. It's, it's normally closed, but in all the pictures of it, it, lo it looks open. This opens your, up your middle ear so that when, for example, you're, uh, you're going up in an elevator or up in an airplane, when you feel your ears start to get stuffy and you swallow, um, the eustachian tube opens and it equalizes pressure. 
So all of these external structures are um, conduct sound to the important inner ear. There's a lot that can go wrong. You can get well, a wax buildup in the outer ear. You can perforate your eardrum. Um, uh, you know, a lot of children get uh, ear infections and they get uh, fluid in this middle ear space. Those cause something called a conductive hearing loss. That is a loss that doesn't conduct sound to the um, important inner ear. Most of those um, problems are treatable. And it's a really simple problem of simply turning down the volume. So if we do need to treat it with some kind of device, it, it's very simple. All it takes is just turning up the volume. Um, so that would be like if, if you needed readers for your eyes, um, it's the same sort of thing. It'd be a very simple um, uh, amplification of sound to make it louder. This is the inner ear. And this, and we, it's called the cochlea, and it is absolutely spectacular um, uh, sensory receptor organ. Um, it's snail shaped. We call it the labyrinth um, because of its intricate um, channels of fluid and membranes that um, that provide a, a, an amazing reception of sound from the tiniest vibrations of the eardrum to very big vibrations from very loud sounds in, in a, 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 a very large dynamic range from very soft sounds to very loud. It's also, um, it, it processes across the pitch range from very low pitches to very high pitches um, in, in, in an incredibly specific and sensitive way. Um, it's called the sensory uh, system or the cochlea, and it, trans it transmits um, uh, its sensory information to the nerve of hearing, the cochlear nerve or the eighth cranial nerve. Um, and so we call this whole mechanism the sensory neural mechanism of hearing. So you've got conductive and sensory neural. Now, because of the intricacy of the inner ear, when something goes wrong, um, it creates a problem that's far more complex than just simply turning up the volume. Um, and that's where the real challenges come in. And I'm going to talk more about those as we go on. So, um, again, um, we have there, we basically have two kinds of hearing loss. They can, you can also have a mixed uh, kind, but one is conductive, where the sound isn't being conducted to the cochlea uh, appropriately. Good news is, most of the time, that that's, that's very treatable, uh, uh, either medically or surgically. Uh, and so, um, so uh, in, in the vast majority of cases, that can be taken care of. The, a good first step, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is to have your hearing checked out so that if there is a treatable, a treatable component, you get that taken care of. Um, uh, and um, and the effect, I, I use a big word here, linear attenuation, all I really mean is um, it just turns the sound down. And so all you have to do to treat it is to turn the sound up. Sensory neural hearing loss, much more complicated and also much more common and also largely untreatable. Um, it results from changes to the uh, outer and inner hair cells, which are part of that intricate system I talked about, of the cochlea. Um, it's generally not treated uh, medically, and the effect of those changes are complicated. Um, and so the, our ability to treat them with any kind of like simple amplifier um, is, is, is more limited than, say, a conductive hearing loss would be. So um, the vast majority of hearing loss is sensory neural. Um, if you have hearing loss uh, because you're getting older or because you inherited um, uh, that, uh, at least partially, um, you have a sensory neural hearing loss for the most part. It's also important, and I'll say this again, that there may be also be a conductive component. For example, um, as you get older, uh, earwax, we call it cerumen, do, um, which normally just... just um, uh, it, uh, it just comes out of your ear canal naturally. Um, it it, um, it doesn't work quite as well, like most things as you get older. And so um, so a lot of people have impacted 
Surumin, and, and that may be a big part of, it may be a part of their problem. And if you could go in and get treated and have half your problem solved um, by simply something as simple as removing wax, then that's a great step in the right direction. So two different kinds of hearing losses. Uh, one's uncomplicated, one's complicated, one's treatable, one's not. Um, and that's the, the nature of hearing and hearing loss in a real, um, in a real small nutshell. Um, so let's talk about um, uh, hearing just in general. About one in 10 Americans um, have some degree of permanent hearing loss, depending on how you define it. And that's approximately 33 million people uh, in the United States. The causes of hearing loss are many, but, um, um, but predominantly due to um, just the um, effect of getting older. Um, and so the, the kind of the compounding influence of, of living your years. Um, in addition to that, there, you may have some, there may be some hereditary uh, hearing loss. You could have disease and otosclerosis and um, um, uh, toxicity to the ears from certain um, drugs. Um, uh, some, many people have noise exposure, not as many as in the old days, um, but it does contribute uh, certainly to um, a certain uh, uh, portion of the population. But the primary cause of hearing loss is simply the aging process. If you, um, if you look at the, uh, so, so uh, as you look at aging and uh, you look at the kinds of things that can go wrong is, um, uh, as you know, there are a number of things, but the top five, hearing loss is one of the top five chronic conditions um, uh, that people have as they get older. So, it, you know, it's an important concern. Um, it's also chronic, and I, I bring that up because when we talk about care and we talk about where you go for care and establishing care, you need to understand that this is the this is a rest of your life um, um, uh, problem that is um, not going to get better. And, you know, I don't want to be negative guy today, but um, it's probably going to get worse. And so, um, so establishing care is an important part of that. If you look at the, um, the, how this, uh, the prevalence of hearing loss, as people get older, you see that uh, it grows and grows um, with age. Um, some younger people have hearing loss, uh, certainly, um, but it, um, it, it is, uh, you know, just like everything else, your ears don't work uh, quite as well as they, as they used to. Um, so this is, and I thought you'd find this interesting uh, because it seems to go against what you hear in the popular press, but this is a fun fact for you on a, um, uh, on a Wednesday afternoon that, that older adults are retaining good hearing longer than previous generations. So you are preserved, your hearing has been preserved um, as a generation more than your parents and certainly more than your grandparents. And we see that with each generational um, change that we see the odds of getting a hearing loss um, are reduced because of general health, because of general health being better. If the population is healthy gen generally, um, then their ears um, are also a part of that generalized um, um, uh, better health. Now, I want to show you this picture, and I'm going to, this, this picture I want to explain a little bit to you because those of you who have had hearing loss have seen this before, but if, you, if you're not quite as familiar, I just want to take a minute um, to show you this picture. It's called an audiogram. And um, an audiogram is just a graph of um, hearing, of, of the lowest um, level at which you can just barely hear sound. And it's plotted as a, fun from, as a function of frequency or pitch from, uh, those of you who are musical, middle C on the piano is here at 250 hertz, and then um, uh, up to high pitches. Now, we actually hear um, to we actually hear when, when we're born out to 20,000 hertz. Um, but that starts to decline in those higher frequencies um, 
really when you get into your 20s. So it starts early. You start losing those those high pitch um, uh, sounds. I did an interview uh, a few years back where um, they were uh, kids were uh, communicating in the classroom by text, and the alerting signal was a real high pitched tone that their teachers couldn't hear. And they were asking me if that was possible, and I'm, yes, it is. It turns out that you you know you start to lose those highest pitches um, uh, um, a long time ago, um, and so. And here, uh, so, uh, so uh, I, as I was saying, this is pitch across the top, and this is loudness um, uh, uh, from top to bottom, from very soft sounds to very loud sounds. If you were, were a 20-year-old kid and we were to test you today, you would hear sounds at zero decibels. Um, if you're not, then you're going to start having probably a little bit of hearing loss. And this, what these uh, these lines show you are the they're called 90th percentile audiograms. That means 90% of people have better hearing than this. 10% have worse in these age groups. So age 30, 40, 50, 60 in men and in women. And so. Um, so the so you see that even in the age 30 group, you're starting to see a little bit of roll off in these higher pitches. Um, and then by the time you get to the 60 year old group, um, uh, oh, 90 percent are better than this. But um, you start to see that hearing can fall off for a large number of um, of people. Um, so what what's the consequence of this and what does this funny graph um, mean? Well, I want to show you how that translates into how you're hearing. And it might help explain some of the things you can hear and can't hear. Um, this is a picture of, uh, I've taken that same audiogram, and now I've put sounds of speech in uh, into the picture. And so um, down here in the lower pitches are the vowel sounds, and they're very strong. Up here in the higher pitches are the consonant sounds, like the S and F and TH sounds, and they're very soft sounds, um, and they're very high in pitch. So let's take a moment and superimpose that 60 decibel hearing loss, that 60 year old hearing loss onto this picture. What happens? Well, they can still hear low pitches very, very well. In fact, you could hear a, a low frequency pin drop. Your hearing is so good in the lower pitches but you see what happens here in the higher pitches. You can't hear these important consonant sounds. And these are very important for meaning and the English language. Fortunately, you can see them on the lips, um, and um, and there's some uh, redundancy in speech that helps you understand things in context and in sentences. But sometimes you can't hear them. And if you add to that um, background noise that can cover up those very soft sounds, um, you can get into uh, a, a position where you can hear that speech is happening, but you can't make out quite um, quite what it is you're hearing in the speech. So if your spouse says that you are mumbling, you may be mumbling, but you may not be. And what they may be is hearing your voice in these low pitches very well, but they can't quite make out the um, the consonant sounds especially if you're talking to them from another room or if you're talking to them with background noise. You see this a lot in, in like restaurants where the, uh, the background noise will just cover up these high-pitched sounds in a way that add to the hearing loss. And although uh, a person can perceive that somebody's talking, they may not be able to quite understand um, the words. So, and the worse the hearing loss gets, the worse the problem gets. Um, but even in mild hearing loss, uh, these uh, these soft sounds can get covered up to a point where somebody might not have quite the same perception that they did when they were younger. Um, and then by the time you get up to hearing loss in the severe range, um, you, you really can't hear speech without some assistance, unless it's very loud or very close. Um, so when does this become a problem? And and that's it, it's a very good question because. If you have the same hearing loss as the person sitting next to you, it doesn't mean that you have the same problem. 
Um, you have the, may have the same audiogram, um, but it doesn't mean that your your communication problem is identical. Um, it, it's a it's not a one size fit all fits all story. It depends on a lot of things. Age of onset is one. If it happens later in life, um, it'll have far less of an impact for various reasons. Speed of onset is another. If I gave you a mild hearing loss, if you had normal hearing and I gave you a mild hearing loss tomorrow, you'd be mad at me. Um, whereas if that, if that hearing loss came on gradually over time, you probably wouldn't even notice it. And, and so speed of onset is often a, a factor. The degree of loss plays, uh, uh, plays into it, but we see all the time clinically, some people will come in with a whole lot of hearing loss and we'll wonder how they function. Um, whereas other people will come in with a little bit of a mild hearing loss and they're having all kinds of problems. So degree matters, but um, it it's, uh, it's, uh, varies among people. Um, also, as we get older, we don't quite hear um, as well. Uh, it, we don't hear speech as well, even when we get above those soft threshold sounds. So, so um, we especially don't hear as well in, in, in temporal domain. So if, if speech is speeded up, like in commercials and things like that, um, we can't process it as fast as we did when we were kids. Um, and so that kind of decline can, is different in different people. And uh, it, can, um, it can dictate how well, or how much a, a hearing loss will impact somebody's ability. And then finally, communication demand. You know, if you sit in quiet environments uh, and uh, you have a TV listener and you, you, that's what you do, um, you're, um, it, it may not, hearing loss may not bother you as much as it, if somebody who's active in a, um, you know, active in, in meetings at work or meetings in the community and they need to hear what's going on around the room. So all of these things um, add up to say, you know, the, add up in some way to say, yes, you have a problem or no, you don't. There's not a formula we can put this in to uh, help us to understand um, when a hearing loss becomes a problem. And so it, it's, uh, it's multifactorial. The consequences of hearing loss are many. Um, I, I, I have a list, they're not in any order. I think about, you know, wh where I think about, I'm looking at, uh, at fatigue here. Um, we've, you know, spent the last few years on Zoom meetings and, and, uh, and, and um, just in, in different sorts of contexts. And sometimes things are, people are hard to hear, and sometimes there's interference. And we learn that when, when, you, when you can't hear somebody well, it takes a lot more effort to try to get through a meeting than, um, than when you can hear somebody clearly and loudly and, and so on. So hearing loss works that way. Um, somebody with a hearing loss has to work twice as hard um, as somebody who doesn't um, to hear in, uh, in their real life setting. Um, it also, we, we find um, that, that a lot of times when, so when people come, do kind of finally come to see us as audiologists and, and they're, they want to know what's wrong with their hearing and they want to know if there's something they can do about it, it's that they've reached a point in life where, uh, where something happened, they had to give something up. So it's this idea of social isolation or reduced involvement, maybe in family events, um, maybe in, um, in just in socializing, the, the, the backing off of things you used to do um, that you always liked to do, but now you can't feel like you're a part of it. Something usually is a, reaches a tipping point for people and it has to do with social isolation. The um, Surgeon General came out with a, um, with a statement on social isolation and loneliness earlier this year. And it was a really compelling um, discussion, you can Google it, um, of the impact of loneliness and social isolation. And part of that begins for many people with hearing loss. And so, um, so it's important to watch for, um, for those kinds of indicators as, you, um, as, you, as your hearing begins to, um, to go bad a little bit. So when we look, we, we, you know, if you said, who needs a hearing aid? Do I need a hearing aid? 
And, and I think, I, I look at these two questions. Is your hearing loss causing you communication problems? You and or a loved one um, causing uh, communication problems? Um, if, and the answer may be yes, and that may not matter, um, but it may. And so the second part, is that problem, the communication problem, bad enough that you want to do, the, you, know, you want to get hearing aids? And I just would, I would just say to you, nobody wants hearing loss. Nobody wants hearing aids. We get that. Um, it, it, um, it, it's okay. It's okay to feel that way and think that way. But for most people, they, they cross some, um, some line where getting, uh, where wearing hearing aids is better than the problems that they're experiencing from their hearing loss. And so if the answer is that yes to these two, then I say um, you, it's time to go for it. So I want to talk about hearing aids uh, briefly and then um, a little bit about how you access them. So the most common, uh, so the most common cause of hearing loss is sensory neural, is, is sensory neural from the aging process. Um, it, it's not treatable. Um, and um, it's not treatable medically by drugs or by surgery. Um, and so the, the alternative is hearing aid amplification. Um, so hearing aids are the most common solution. Some people solve their, their need-specific problems. Like if, if you're only having trouble watching television, you can get a television listener. They're very easy to, um, to get, and, and they work really well for specific solutions. But if your problem is more general, um, then hearing aid amplification is the solution. We fit them on people from mild hearing loss to, uh, to uh, people with profound hearing loss. Uh, when you get up in the profound level, um, you met Dr. Bennett earlier. She's an expert on cochlear implants, which are uh, we don't have time to talk about today, but that's kind of the, the next step as you, uh, um, if hearing loss progresses that far. Um, about 28% to 30% of those with hearing loss use hearing aids. Now, you've seen a lot in the popular press about uh, the other 70% and why people don't pursue hearing aids. And it's really, uh, you know, they cost too much, they're not accessible, you hear all those things. But actually, it's that people don't want them. And that's okay. Uh, you may not want hearing aids right now either, um, but you may get to the point where you do. Um, and we see this, just so you know, in other countries where we have, they have socialized medicine and hearing aids are free and the care associated with it is all free, still about the same percentage of hearing, uh, people with hearing loss pursue these things. So we don't really have the kinds of barriers that people talk about in the popular press. It's just that most people don't want to go in this direction, but many people do, and they tend to be active people who... Uh, who uh, take care of their health um, and consider their hearing to be an important part of, um, of taking care of their health. Modern hearing aids, I, I say, if you haven't heard a hearing aid in three years, you haven't heard a hearing aid. The, the technology is spectacular. Um, what they stuff into a little plastic device that goes over your ear or in your ear um, and runs, on a, uh, runs for 24 hours on a, uh, a charge uh, of the battery is remarkable um, and and very sophisticated and very different. When when I was young in the profession, you'd put hearing aids on and you hear everything. It was a we called it a wall of sound. You'd it, it was like oh this is horrible. And now you put on a modern hearing aid and the the background noise actually goes down. It's it's really kind of remarkable uh, the technology that has evolved. Um, it, the, what's available to you is, um, is, is really high quality and it is in, for various reasons that I'll talk about a little bit, it's important that, um, the device be high quality because w when it is, it's, um, you're going to be more successful. Um, and then in addition to the, div um, the hearing aids themselves, they, there's wireless connectivity that can help in tremendous ways, um, uh, um, making the signal louder than background noise in, in sophisticated ways. I, I laugh a little bit when, um, when, I, uh, when I made this slide, I was 
I was thinking I have I have an introductory textbook that the students um, uh, that, that are studying audiology read. And when I first published it, my first edition was about um, around 2000. And uh, by two, or 1998 or 99, I think, by the second edition, which was 2010, it's now in its third edition, but by the second edition, 2010, I had to rewrite the entire section on hearing aids because things had changed so dramatically because the power supply that we were able to put in a hearing aid um, was, was so much better that we were able to change from analog hearing aids to digital hearing aids. Everything got much smaller. Um, the circuits um, uh, were so good that we started worrying about things that we didn't even know we could worry about um, back in my early days. Um, and, you know, so now hearing aids uh, are adjust themselves, sophisticated hearing aids. They talk to each other, too. So your right hearing aid will talk to your left hearing aid so that um, that they're in sync when they're hearing different sounds coming from different places in your sound space. So pretty sophisticated gadgets. Um, they, um, they have things that... Um, they, they have directional microphones that can change direction depending on wh where they're hearing speech from. They have um, beautiful ways of getting rid of sort of constant background noise. Um, we used to, uh, your, your parents and grandparents hearing aids used to squeal all the time. Um, that's called feedback. Um, now the newer devices are, um, are better at isolating the microphone from the loudspeaker, but also is sophisticated digital um, noise um, cancellation that allows us to uh, to give more boost um, uh, without that um, without that uh, feedback we call it. Um, the hearing aids are automatic and they adapt to the environment. You can uh, they can talk to your phone. Your phone can talk to them. They can talk to your computer. Um, they're they're. Uh, Beautiful connectivity to the world now. It's still Bluetooth, so sometimes it it uh, it forgets. But um, but generally, it works really well. Um, and and the Bluetooth technology is improving tremendously as well. And then your hearing aids can remember things. Can um, um, tell us how long you've been wearing them. Can learn about different environments and can be trained to um, to react uh, in different environments. Um, they're uh, one of the manufacturers makes a hearing aid that it basically trained using artificial intelligence. It trained that hearing aid to listen to speech and noise and learn how to hear that speech and noise um, and integrated that into their um, their noise suppression system. So really, really cool stuff happening on the hearing aid front with um, technology. Um, but it's not the device. It's not about the device because there are so many um, uh, permutations of of devices. I showed you different styles. Um, you know what you can wear, what you what is right for you, and your individual hearing loss is um, is uh, is mind boggling, and we need to narrow it down to what's right for you. So, hearing aids are alone are not enough. Um, frankly, you need our help um, uh, with counseling and education and just managing your hearing loss in general. And then, um, again, your ear canal is not like the person sitting next to you. That means you're going to have a, a different experience with the same device. We need to manage and program that hearing aid to your specific ear canal and your specific hearing loss. Um, and so, um, and then, and then finally, as I said earlier, this is a chronic problem. Again, I don't mean to be a downer, but it isn't going away, and it's not going to get better, um, and it's probably going to get worse. And so, um, so you need to establish care, and um, and and uh, um, so that you have consistent benefit from your hearing aids as your hearing loss changes. So. What do you do next then? And I'm going to kind of wrap it up with a little bit of story about the process of, of establishing care and going forward. 
one of the things you can do is screen, is just have your hearing screened. And I'll talk about uh, a really uh, clever uh, technique for that in a minute. See if you have a, a problem. And if you do, um, you can talk to your physician about a referral or, um, or just make an appointment with audiology to establish care. And I think that's an important first step. And I worry so much about people self-treating because we see so much in the clinics here at Henry Ford that's, that's treatable. So people will come in with half of their hearing losses from earwax and, and you, you, you take care of the earwax and you've got half the problem solved. And so, um, so we think it's important. And there are also some things that can go on in your middle ear particularly that can cause real problems to your inner ear and, and even to your nervous system. So, you know, if you're having problems, let's get you, make sure everything's okay medically um, first. So establish care early. Um, and then you can monitor, you can get a baseline audiogram, know what it is. It's not causing, if the hearing loss isn't causing you that much problem, it's fine. Um, let's just monitor it. If it starts getting worse, then we'll have a baseline to look at and we can begin to compare and see what's happening. And then when you're ready for hearing aids, we can start moving in that direction. So first today, right now, after I'm, after we're done with this lecture, you can go get your computer and get a set of earphones, headphones, and, uh, and go to henryford.com slash hearing screen, and you can screen your hearing. Um, and it's a, it's a, uh, accurate, um, general description of, of, of your hearing, and it'll give you some indication of which direction, um, you might, whether you should come in and, and see us, um, for, uh, further testing. So, Screen your hearing in the privacy of your own home. Um, all you need is a quiet room and some uh, earphones and a computer. Um, so uh, then if you're ready, um, talk to your, um, your uh, medical provider, ask them for a referral to audiology, or just call us and we'll give you some numbers uh, and, and come in and see us. Um, you'll receive a comprehensive hearing uh, evaluation. We'll look in your ears. Make sure we can see that eardrum, that everything's clear. Um, we'll do something called emittance measures, which are which look at your middle ear function um, to make sure that you don't have a problem behind your eardrum. Uh, and and the, the first two kind of rule out or rule in um, medical need, uh, need for medical assessment. Um, the pure tone audiometry gives us the audiogram we talked about earlier, gives us kind of a picture of your hearing sensitivity. And then we test how well you hear um, speech uh, above those, um, those uh, your audiometric levels. And finally, if, if you do need a medical referral, um, we'll get you to the right place to get that taken care of so that we can um, move to any next steps uh, if you want to go in that direction. Um, you'll be counseled and educated regarding hearing loss um, and introduced to options for treatment. If you're interested in treatment, we'll um, determine first, are you a candidate? Are you going to benefit? Um, and then uh, if, if so, we'll go through um, kind of an extensive selection process to get the, the style and the, um, and, and the different features right. Um, they'll be fitted, hearing aids will be fitted to your hearing loss, verified in your ear canal um, that we're, we're meeting, what we expect to, that we're delivering to the the eardrum, what we expect to be, and then we'll make adjustments as needed. And then, you know, most people go and they, they try their hearing aids for a couple of weeks and they'll come back and, and um, say, oh, these are just fine. Or, you know, I have a little trouble with my own voice, or I have a little trouble uh, in this environment. And we've got a, a number of parameters we can tweak to uh, try and uh, shape this up to um, meet your um, environmental needs. Um, so that's the process. Now, what do you look for um, when, you, as you go out there? Uh, again, you know, I, I, it's for us, uh, you know, here at Henry Ford, uh, we have a big audiology group. They're a wonderful group of people. You met Dr. Bennett earlier. Um, uh, it, you know, to us, it's about providing care. Um, we, we don't care about selling device 
devices. You want to look for a doctorate level audiologist. Um, we train, we actually do the clinical education component of the Wayne State University AUD program. That's the Doctor of Audiology program. So we we are in charge of shaping these kids up to be great clinicians. And by the time they graduate, they're amazing. And they have a, a wealth of knowledge and experience to, um, to help you um, find solutions for your hearing. So you want to look for somebody who's got an excellent education and that's committed to excellence and to education. Um, if you can, you want to influence free environment uh, like the Henry Ford. Um, uh, you want custom selected and fitted devices um, uh, with high quality care until your needs are met, until we get it right. Um, and then finally, I would just say that, you know, we've seen in, in recent years, we've seen um, places, go out of, places go out of business or give up on hearing care. CVS, um, the uh, pharmacy store, started a chain of hearing aids along the East Coast, um, and they hired a lot of people, and then they closed them all um, and uh, fired everybody. Um, we've seen one of the big, a couple of years ago or last year, one of the big box stores gave up on this because it's not what they do, um, but it is what we do. And so um, so go see an established audiologist um, because you're going to need continual treatment as your hearing loss progresses. Um, so that's kind of my suggestion about how you look for the right provider. If you happen to be looking at Henry Ford Health System, we're happy about that. Um, we have eight locations. Um, uh, our three uh, biggest hospitals in the region, the, um, right here downtown, West Bloomfield, Wyandotte, uh, across the street at the Templin Building. We opened a new center in Brownstown. We've been at Fairlane for a long time. Uh, Gross Point Pearson is now reopened after a fire. Um, Lakeside, we have a very big practice there. And then finally in the new Plymouth Medical Center. So if you want to seek our, our services, we're everywhere, or we try to be. Um, and then um, uh, finally, I just want to say that uh, um, here's a number for an appointment. You can visit us online um, and, uh, and learn more about the audiology services and hearing aids. So in summary, then, hearing loss is, is a common problem. Um, it, um, it, it, uh, it, it increases with age. Um, it's generally not treatable except with hearing aids. Hearing aids are, are amazing uh, technology for a little tiny device, but care is an important part of that care. Um, and if you want to see us at, uh, at Henry Ford Hospital, we, I have a magnificent team of audiologists and uh, uh, ready to uh, help you out with all your hearing needs. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Bennett. Dr. Bennett? Um, and we do have our first question for Dr. Stack. The first question is, um, can hearing aids or do hearing aids help with tinnitus or ringing in the ears? Oh, that's a, that's a, a fabulous question. Yes, in fact, um, it, it's the number one solution for tinnitus. So tinnitus or ringing in the ears is often a byproduct of hearing aids. Um, it hap it, we think, you know, the theories are that um, as you lose your, as the hair cells in your inner ear, as you begin to lose them, um, the, the brain is expecting sound that's not coming. And, um, and so it creates rather, sort of like a phantom uh, uh, of sound in your ears. Now I'm simplifying things in a great way because we could do a whole session on tinnitus, but um, the uh, but the number one first step in um, in trying to treat tinnitus is the use of hearing aids. It's just that there's enough sound coming in from the device itself that it seems to um, make tinnitus less annoying or more more tolerant to that. Thank you for that. So. Um... It looks like somebody requested what the computer or uh, online screening website was. So um, we are happy to to type that into the the chat box. You know, yeah, the, your head, Doctor Stack. 
Yeah, it, it was, uh, it was, I do, uh, www.henryford slash hearing screen. I just sent Over. that in the chat box to everyone. Okay. Yeah, or if you go to Henry Ford slash audiology, there's a link to it. Uh, and it's a really clever little screener. And it'll, it'll give you an idea, a little bit of the shape of um, your hearing loss. The next question we got is, what is the average cost for a pair of hearing aids? And does Medicare cover any of the cost related to hearing aids? Yeah, uh, Medicare um, covers uh, your hearing testing. Uh, Medicare does not cover hearing aids. Um, a, a typical cost of um, you, we think about uh, it's for so I don't think about the, the cost of a device, but the cost of care uh, and the device ten, tends to be bundled because of insurance policies. Um, but typically, it would be about two thousand dollars for a pair of hearing aids. Now, many people in Michigan, and this is this is actually pretty regional um, uh, thing because in many states, people don't have hearing aid coverage as part of their insurance. But I think because of the, um, of the, um, well, th there's a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of you have coverage, um, have hearing aid coverage in your, um, in your commercial um, insurance program. So that's the first thing you should check. Um, see if you have coverage for your hearing aids. Um, uh, many, uh, many of you do, um, but some of you don't. And the, you know, and I, and I think that that it's important that you kind of set your um, your sights. If you think of about a thousand dollars a year at the entry level, then that'll get you kind of in the 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 um, entry ballpark. Hearing aids. Um, the most sophisticated ones are are more expensive than that. They um, because the technology is is more expensive. Thank you. Yeah. So no more questions yet. We'll give it just another minute. And I actually have a a question. I was wondering if you know while we're waiting for the other ones to come in. Yeah. You talked in your presentation about you know it's important to establish care with us. And the best first step is to see an audiologist or someone who can help diagnose your hearing loss, because our ability to self-diagnose hearing loss is not so great. Um, and I know that you have done some really interesting research on the ability to self-diagnose. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, it, yeah. So that's a very good point. And, you know, and thank you, Dr. Bennett. I know that, uh, so Dr. Bennett and I work together and and we're, you know, we're, we're sort of surprised sometimes. Somebody will say, you know, I'm having a little trouble in my left ear, and then we'll test their hearing, and they don't have any hearing in their left ear. So, you know, we're surprised by the, the sort of lack of, um, that, that some people don't quite have, uh, that, that self-diagnosis is not easy. And um, especially if the hearing loss comes on, gradually, um, you, you really don't know how much hearing, it, people aren't that great at it. And uh, yeah, we did, uh, we did some research. We were, um, we were studying, um, we were studying the effect of hearing loss on, on scoring measures of cognitive function. We were doing this with the psychology department at Wayne State. And what we found was um, we, we wanted to groups that identified themselves with hearing loss and groups that identified themselves with no hearing loss. And we, we tested the hearing of both groups and found that the groups who identified themselves with no hearing loss had a lot of hearing loss. Some of them did. And, um, and there were certain personality traits that went along with that, including a difference between men and women um, uh, it, in terms of who thinks they do and who thinks they don't have hearing loss. It was, it, we could, it could be funny. Um, we could make a joke out of it. <laughs> it tends to, you know, it tends to be us men who are a little stubborn about things. So you, you don't have to agree with me. <laughs> yeah, I think it's hard. You don't know what you're missing, right? So. Right, right, yes. 
Okay. So we had an, well, another great question in the okay. chat. Um, should someone with five-year-old hearing aids consider getting some new technology? You know, that's a, uh, I'd say yes. Um, and I, I wondered, you know, I'm looking at you, Dr. Bennett. Now, I bet you'd say yes, too. I would. It, it, you know, it's it, it, to us, it's remarkable how uh, we can even, you, you know, when when a manufacturer upgrades their technology, sometimes they do it incrementally and without any big launch or big uh, to do about it. They just simply, you know, they're always looking for ways to, you know, they're very interested in having the very best technology because that means you'll be happy and that means that we'll be happy. And, and so, um, so they're, they're, they're constantly tweaking. And I've seen people go from even within the same device platform, lose a hearing aid or or have it, you know, be broken or something. And they'll come back and get the same device and it'll just be a year later and they go, oh, that sounds so much better. And it's just because of, of kind of gradual improvement that companies make to try and uh, um, be the best that they can be. So, so five years is a long time in uh, hearing aid life, um, and I think you'd find some some features and um, and just this. It's the sound quality that everyone's chasing. We want to we want to make it as natural as we can for you, even though you have a, a cochlea that doesn't allow us to make it perfect. We still want to get the sound quality that we're delivering to those cochlea as, as good as we can uh, make it. And, and the technology does um, get better and better every year. So, well, why don't we end on, a, on that high note? And uh, unless you have another question for me, Dr. Uh, there is one more in the chat. Okay, one more. Make it a, one make final it a great question. One. Okay. Uh, I struggle in large groups and being distracted by all the ambient noise. Is that the start of a hearing loss? Should I be worried or make an appointment for a screening? Yeah, the um, so um, everybody struggles a little bit in background noise. So the the even people with normal hearing, when the background noise is enough, they'll struggle. Um, but if you're starting to notice it, then probably yes, you're beginning to lose some of those high pitches, um, and uh, and the uh, and and it's it's probably time to at least come at least screen your hearing. That'd be step number one. And again, you can do that at home. Um, uh, second step would be to come in and see us, get your hearing tested. We can we can make sure that there's no that that's not from impacted wax or something like that and then we can get a baseline for you and we can begin to follow that over time and and see how your hearing is progressing so it's never too early uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a covered uh, medical uh, expense you can get a referral from your um, pcp um, it always makes it easier uh, and uh, come in and see us and get your hearing tested. So very good question. Well, I've enjoyed um, uh, talking with you today. Again, we have a, we have a marvelous team of, of talented audiologists at Henry Ford, um, and we're happy to help you. We're happy to guide you uh, as you, um, in, in your hearing journey, um, and, and please call on us if we can assist you in any way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Stack. So as a reminder, this lecture has been recorded and it'll be available to watch again, or you can share with friends and family members. Um, so in the next couple of weeks, if you visit henryford.com slash healthy living lectures, you can view Dr. Stack's presentation from today. Um, and if you'd like to schedule an appointment, as Dr. Sachs said, with any of our audiologists at our Henry Ford audiology department, you can call us at 313-916 three, two, seven, two. So that for an appointment is three, one, three, nine, one, six, three, two, seven, two, or you can visit us online. And I think that's also been sent to the, the chat box at henryford.com slash audiology. If you're not a member of Henry Ford senior healthy living program, 
please feel free to sign up for this free program, which is open to anyone uh, 55 and older. So to enroll in the program, you'll go to henryford.com slash healthy living, or you can call 313-874-5455. And the website and telephone number will also be in the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner. Um, as a member of Healthy Living Program, you'll receive the Healthy Living Newsletter. Um, so that's published three times per year. You'll get the annual Health and Wellness Calendar, as well as invitations to the Healthy Living Lecture Series and many other benefits. So before we conclude for the afternoon and wrap up here, I'd like to announce that the next Healthy Living Lecture event will take place in February of 2024. And that topic will be on heart valve disease. Um, and the date of that event will be announced in January. So you can watch for invitations to these events. And again, visit henryford.com slash healthy living lectures for more information and to register for that like you did today. Um, so on behalf of myself and Dr. Stack and the Healthy Living Program, thank you again for joining us today. And we wish you a safe and happy holiday season.